Amen. Amen. You may be seated. It's good to be here this morning. It's uh, not on the best of circumstances. Uh, I had to get called in last minute yesterday because um, Pastor Chris wasn't able to make it. He's okay, right? You don't have to worry too much about him, but he was in a car accident last or yesterday. And so um, we had a group of guys. We went up to uh, northern Utah to go pheasant hunting and we all got together, and actually Rick and Blake, they were with them, and they're here today, so praise the Lord, they're doing all right, and and, and probably a little sore, but uh, Pastor Chris got beat up a little bit in the back seat, and um, they slipped on some ice, and yeah, his eye's not doing too good, he's got a pretty swollen eye, and his nose is hurt, and uh, his knee's kind of locked up, and Lydia said he woke up this morning just in lots of pain, really sore, so praise the Lord, though, it could have been so much worse, and, and they all walked out of it, and so... Uh, we praise the Lord for that. There's a fourth. Okay, yeah, that's true. I, amen. There was a fourth. Um, and so just pray for him. He is in a lot of pain this morning, and so just pray for his recovery. And so I'm here to fill in for him. Last minute, but hey, you know, the Bible says uh, be ready in season and out of season. And so we're here ready out of season. Normally I try to uh, have a sermon in my back pocket just in case of a circumstance like this. And I actually didn't have anything prepared this week, and I felt like the Lord was was telling me, hey, I should probably like get my sermon kind of an idea of 2 Corinthians 2 just in case, you know, everyone's getting sick, so maybe Pastor Chris might get sick this month or something. And so I started to kind of read it and understand it, and then, well, he's kind of sick, you know, kind of hurt. So um, anyways, um, but I'm blessed to be here this morning. Um, really quick, I have a, a, an announcement. Diane wanted me to ask for more uh, volunteers for being an usher or a greeter at the door. And so if that's something you're interested in, if you want to get plugged in here in a ministry, we can really use help being a greeter or being an usher. And so you can speak to Diane for more information on that. And then other than that, we're ready to uh, get into our study. So if you guys would, open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 this morning. I'm going to be trying to go through uh, 2 Corinthians when I get these opportunities to teach on Sunday. And so last time we went through uh, chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians. And just a reminder of a few things about this book. So, of course, it's the second letter that we have. It was written um, by Paul to this church in Corinth. Now, remember, Corinth, it's this place. It was um, in the southern, southern providence of Greece called Achaia, Achaia. And so Corinth was this place that was, um, it was really a wicked city. You know, it'd be kind of like in that day would be the Las Vegas of its day, Sin City, right? And, and if you were a, a Corinthian, if you were from that place, people would, would look at you like you were a scumbag or you were a dirt ball, right? If, if, you were, um, if you had a theater going on and in the play, you had someone who was a Corinthian, they would play typically a drunkard or a gambler or just someone who's, who's not a very good person in the story of this play. And so this is the church that we're talking about that is now planted in the midst of all of this darkness that Paul had planted uh, previously. And so there's lots of potential for this church to grow and, and to be able to do ministry and preach the gospel in such a dark and wicked place. But with that came trials and tribulations and, and false teachers were coming into the church and, and, and the church began to bring compromises in. And so 1 Corinthians all about that. Paul is addressing a lot of um, hardship and a lot of uh, painful discussions with them and some of the things that they were going wrong, and so he had to correct them on that. Now, when he corrected them, some of them did receive it well, but others, not so much. They were kind of offended and upset at Paul because he was rebuking them. And if you've ever read 1 Corinthians, you know, he, he doesn't lay off. You know, he, he just goes for it, and he says what it is and, and what they're going through. And so some people weren't happy about this, and so they began to talk bad on Paul and say that, that Paul really wasn't um, called by God, and, and Paul was a false teacher, and they began to spread these rumors. And, and accusations against Paul. And so we're in this place now where, where Paul and, and this church, again, Paul had started this church up, and so he has this deep, intimate relationship with these people. But right now, their relationship is a little rocky because he's, he's trying to um, love on them and correct them, but he's still having these issues and, and a little bit of confrontation. And so in 2 Corinthians, we see a lot about what Paul is, is writing here is, is one, to comfort and encourage the Corinthians. And we saw that in chapter 1 is, is the comfort through sufferings and, and Paul's personal experience through sufferings and how Jesus allows us to go through sufferings. He allows us to go through tribulation because that, that 
when he comforts us through that and he overcomes those issues and those tribulations in our lives, we then are able to comfort people who are going through that same exact scenario, right? If you've gone through something, it's much easier to, to relate and to have empathy for people who are going through a very similar situation. And so he talks about this comfort of Christ. And he also is going to be talking about um, um, refuting these false teachers and, and trying to explain his heart here, right? He's trying to explain to them, hey, when I rebuked you guys and when I, I said these things in my first letter and when I first met with you guys, understand that I'm not doing it out of hatred. I'm not doing it out of anger. I'm not doing it to be a jerk, but because I love you guys and I see you guys are, are living in compromise and, and I care for you and I want to correct you guys because you guys have such amazing potential, but it's being ruined by sin and compromise that you're allowing through the church. And so, we didn't finish all of chapter 1, so we'll kind of breeze through the end of chapter 1 into chapter 2, and it, it kind of flows well with the beginning of chapter 2. Keeping in mind, uh, Paul did not write these chapters and verses. Chapters and verses in all of the Bible were added later by scholars, so that way it'd make it a little bit easier for us to be able to find certain places in these letters. Um, you know, you, you take a book like Genesis or Isaiah or, or Ezekiel, some of the, the biggest books of the Bible, it'd be really, really hard to be able to um, have to go through there without any chapters and verses and find a specific place that you want to re reference to. And so they were added in later. So just keep it in mind that as we go through the end of chapter one, going into chapter two, it still kind of continues the same thought. But um, where we left off was in chapter 12, we talked about how Paul was was explaining his sincerity to them and that he was in, in genuineness. And then he begins to explain to him, explain to the church in verse number 15, um, his, his traveling plans and why he's a sincere person and, and um, some of the accusations they were bringing upon him. So looking back at chapter 1 and verse number 15, it says, And in this confidence I intended to come to you before that you might have a second benefit, to pass by the way of you to Macedonia, to come again from Macedonia to you and be helped by you on my way to Judea. And so Paul had explained to the Corinthians his plan was on his way to Macedonia, he would meet with them. And then on his way back from his trip um, from Macedonia, he would meet with them again. So there's going to be two meetings. He only made it to the first one. When he first went there and he, and he talked with them, it wasn't a very good meeting. It was very confrontational. There's a lot of arguments. There's a lot of pain inside of that visit. And so he's going to explain why he decided not to come back the second time. People were... Um, accusing Paul, saying, see, this man, he, he said he would come back, but he's fickle, right? He, he doesn't care about us because he didn't come back like he said he would, so you can't really trust him, or, or you can't really take him for his word because he's a liar. And so Paul is now defending himself, and again, we'll, we'll see as we get down to the end of this chapter, his explanation for not coming back a second time. But continuing in verse 17, he says, therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan, do I do it according to the flesh, that with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no? So Paul is saying, hey, is my yeses, noes, and my noes, yeses? Am I, am I just planning carelessly because I don't really care about you guys, and one day I want to come, and, and the next day I don't want to come? He's saying, no, my, my yeses are yes, and my noes are no. And to back up, have proof of this, and, and why I, I can say this with confidence to you guys, is in verse 18 it says, but as God is faithful... Our word to you was not yes and no, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all of the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. And so now Paul is using the explanation of God, and he's using that as kind of a backup to say, listen, God in our lives is never yes and no. If God has promised something inside of your lives and he says yes, then it's going to be yes. He's not going to say yes to you one day and the next day say, you know what, I decided I don't want that anymore, no. Or vice versa, it's not no and then yes. If, if God has promised you something, if God has said something in your life, you can take it to the bank that he's going to fulfill it. And he's, he's using this as an example to say, listen, I'm the one that's preaching this to you guys, right? And, and you guys know my deep, genuine relationship with the Lord. And so let that be evidence to you that I wouldn't try to preach something contrary by not doing as the Lord would do. And so I was sincere in this. I, I was wanting to come a second time. 
And then he says in verse 21, it's not in his own strength. It says in verse 21, now he who establishes us with you in Christ. And so again, it's, it's being grounded. It's being standing firm in Christ as anointed, as he has anointed us in his God who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. And so we are established. We stand firm with God and, and he is the one who anointed us he is the one that sealed us, and he is the one that has given us a spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. That word anointed there, a lot of times people take that word and, and, and try to specify it to only certain people as if only certain believers have this, this anointing over their lives, right? Like the preacher and Pastor Chris, you know, you, you were just so anointed this Sunday. What an amazing service. And then the next Sunday, maybe he drops the ball. Oh, he wasn't really anointed that day, right? No, that's, that's not the case, right? It's, it's as a believer, you are anointed, and that anointing isn't there one day and gone the next. The word anointed actually is the same word for Mashiach, which is Messiah in the Hebrew. So that means that Jesus, the Messiah, was the anointed one. And for us as believers, now that we have accepted Jesus, we have received his salvation that same anointing that was over Jesus, the anointed one, is now over us as believers. And so if you're in here this morning and you are a believer, you have that anointing over your life. And so standing firm in that anointing that God has called you to, and then also it says that he has sealed us. And so it's like this seal, this, this stamp of, of wax that you would put on this letter to, to show that it was from you, right? This is what God does for us. He seals us and says, you are mine. And, and that's not going to change anything, right? I claim you. It's much more than, than you just following me and, and you're kind of just back there and I'm not really paying attention to you. No, God is saying, I'm proud of you and I want my stamp of approval over your life that you are sealed with me and nothing can change that. And then lastly, it says, and has been given to us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So you want to know why we can be guaranteed that we've been sealed with the spirit of God? why we can have a guarantee that we have the anointing over our lives, it's because of the Holy Spirit inside of our hearts. The Holy Spirit inside of our lives is, is a, a, a guarantee that we are His, and that one day we are going to be with Jesus restored fully without any sin, right? We are a work in progress right now, and, and we're going to continue to mess up. We're going to continue to fail, and, and God is bringing us into this place of restoration until one day we are finally with him, fully restored. And so up until that point, we can know that we are, are sealed with him, and, and that day is going to come because there's been a down payment on our lives with the Holy Spirit, right? And and. and Jesus or our God is not going to, to give up on that and give quits. It's almost like if, if God put us on the layover, uh, layaway program, right? And we're on layaway and he's investing money in us every single month. It would be foolish if, if you invested all this money in layaway and then you decided to back out, right? But, but God has, has begun an investment in us and he's not going to back out of that investment. And we have proof of that because of the Holy Spirit and the work that the Holy Spirit does in our lives. And we're sealed with that Holy Spirit. It says in verse 23, Moreover, I call God as witness against my soul that to snare you I came no more, or excuse me, to uh, spare you, I came no more to Corinth. Not that we have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers of you of joy, uh, for by faith you stand. And so now this is the explanation of verse 15, right? He explains that he came once, but he's not coming again. And he explains here why he decided not to come again. And that reason is, is to spare them, right? Because the first visit was so painful. It was, it was so hard. It, it, it made such a toll on their relationship. He said, you know what? It's probably best that we don't see each other right now, right? Maybe we need some time of, of cooling off a little bit. I'm upset at you guys. You guys are upset at me. Let's just let's take some time and cool off and, and know, too, that, that also you don't have to rely on me for your salvation, right? Um, it's not my faith that is saving you, it's your own faith. And so maybe there's some things in your own life that you need to work out without me in this time. And so he's saying, listen, don't, don't rely on me. Um, you know, just because I said I'm coming and I decided not to doesn't mean I'm, I'm fickle and you can't rely on me, but I really think it's best at this point that I don't come see you. And so instead he writes a letter and he explains it. He says, and going into chapter two in verse number one, it says, but I determined this within myself that I would not come again to you in sorrow, 
For if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad but the one who is made sorrowful by me? So not only was it to spare them, but it was also in a way to to spare himself, right? He was also pretty heartbroken here. You have to think, you have to put yourself in in the shoes of Paul. Some of these people, man, are the, the ones that he brought to Christ personally. He planted this church and he built this amazing, wonderful relationship with these people. And so to have this 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 um, relationship with them that is being tainted by by bitterness and and rumors and these other things, it was heartbreaking to him because again he saw what potential these people had to do good and to preach the gospel in such a wicked place, and yet they were they were turning against Paul and they were turning against the Lord and, and falling into sin. And so he's saying, man, I was very sorrowful as well. He says in verse three, and I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came I should have sorrow over those whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you all that my joy is in the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. This thing here in verse 3, it says, and I wrote this very thing to you. Now, a couple scholars and have different ideas and, and debate what this means and, and this letter that he wrote if he's referring to first corinthians and, and some people actually believe that he wrote another letter in between first and second corinthians which would make first corinthians first corinthians and then um, there would be another letter and then this would be third corinthians right we don't know that right we we aren't 100 percent sure some people believe that some people don't um i don't really have a problem with it whether he did write another letter or not we don't have it, and that's totally okay because it wasn't inspired by the Holy Spirit if he did write it, right? Not that, that he wrote it out of his flesh, but there's a reason why the Lord let that out. There's a reason why we didn't preserve it and allow it to be in the Word of God. And, and it's not because the Word of God is incomplete or missing different books or different letters. The Word of God is 100% complete. Anything that, that was written outside of the Bible, God knew he didn't want it in the Word of God. And we must be careful because there are different cults and different religions that will try to say that the Bible is incomplete. And so you need this book to try to fill in the holes of the Bible. And, and the Bible has this error and that error. No, this is the perfect inspired word of God. And there is no error inside of it. And so if there's anything that was left out, there was that for a reason. But anyways, with Paul, he wrote this thing to them. And it was out of sorrow, he says, that that um, he he... He wanted to see them doing good, and he wanted to have joy out of seeing them do good, but yet there was much infliction and anguish of heart when he wrote to them. And, you know, one of the things that Paul Paul did, again, he was very critical with them in 1 Corinthians, and, and you know, he, he wasn't afraid to speak his mind to them and, and what they were doing wrong. And he's trying to explain to them, hey, just because I was critical of you doesn't mean I hate you, doesn't mean I'm your enemy. Oftentimes, it's, it's in our nature, it's in our flesh, that if someone begins to criticize us, we instantly associate them with our enemy. We assume that they don't like us and that, that we are against them. But the reality is, that's not always the case, right? Sometimes it's good that we have brothers and sisters in our life to keep us in check, to be critical of us, um, not in a, a, this judgmental way of, of picking at each other's sins and problems, but also to be able to keep each other accountable inside of our lives. And so Paul's explained to them, hey, I, I love you guys, right? Anytime I was critical, understand where my heart was. It, it was it was out of seeing you grow. It was out of wanting to see you have joy in, in the Lord. And you, again, had lots of pot uh, potential, um, and yet you're the one attacking me, even though my heart is really for you, not against you. Looking at verse 5, he says, But if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you, um, to some extent, not to be too severe. This punishment which was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man, so that, on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Now Paul is going to be using this example here of this man who was in the church, it actually explains it in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So if you want to keep your finger here and just flip over a few pages to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. One of the issues that they were having in the church was there was this man who was in sin. 
and the church, rather than rebuking this man and correcting this man of the sin, um, they were boastful about it. They were proud that they were accepting it and they were okay with it. And so it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 1, it is actually repro- reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife. So this man who was in the church, he was in a lustful, sinful relationship with his stepmom. And, and rather than the church realizing that this brother was in such a terrible sin, they knew it was a sin, they knew it was wrong, but rather than, than speaking to him about it and bringing him into this place of repentance, it says in verse number two, and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. And so rather than, than seeing the situation as it, as it is, rather than seeing this man in his sins and, and confronting him about it and rebuking him about it and correcting him in this sin, they said, man, we're just such a loving church and we, we want to love this man and, and we're just, we're so gracious, right? And so this man who's in sin, man, we just, we're going to love him and we're going to be gracious towards him. And, and they didn't talk to him about it and they let him continue in this sin. And so in 1 Corinthians, Paul is rebuking them for this. He's saying, no, what you guys need to do is, is pretty intense. You guys need to, to talk to this guy about it. You guys need to rebuke him and, and bring him into this place in his life where he comes to repentance and he realizes what sin he's in. And if he doesn't come into a place of repentance after you do this, then you have to kick him out. You have to be very severe with this man. Now that might seem a little, little tough, right? A little severe. The fact that you'd be willing to kick someone out of your congregation because they were living inside of the sin unrepentant. But Paul is trying to explain here, hey, if, if, you don't, if you're not severe with this man, then he's going to continue to live in this sin and not realize how much he's breaking the, the heart of the Lord, how much the Lord is, is hurting over his life and how much he's destroying his own life. And so if you talk to him and you let him know that he's in this sin and this is not okay and he's not repentant about it, you have to be severe and you have to say, I'm sorry, but, but you can't fellowship with us anymore. And that's what ultimately would bring this guy when he would be kicked out of this congregation that he would eventually realize what sin he was really living in and the lifestyle that he was living was wrong and that would be the thing that brought him into repentance. And so he's very severe with them in 1 Corinthians and now we see here This man, in our story, 1 Corinthians 5, when he was kicked out of the church, he did become repentant. He was um, recognizing what sin he was living in, but what happened is he went back to the church and he asked for forgiveness and he repented of his sins. And they said, no, you can't fellowship with us anymore. You're sinful. We're not going to forgive you. And then they were completely the opposite way, right? And so they began super, super laid back, and, and they were like, yeah, you can do whatever. We're, we're just super gracious and forgiving. And now they're saying, no, forget it. You, you, I don't care if you're repenting. I don't care if you realize what you've done wrong. You can't fellowship with us anymore. And Paul's like, man, what is wrong with you guys? You know, he's probably just like, like so fed up with them. He's saying, this man is repentant. This man realized what he has done and that it's wrong, and so you should be receiving him back with love and with comfort because he has come to a place of repentance. You see the heart of these these Corinthians, man. It it feels like they're just, they're completely missing the Holy Spirit in their lives. They're not being led by the Lord and they're not really um, understanding the heart of the Lord here because they went from one extreme to the other. First being super gracious about sin that they shouldn't have been and then being far too severe to a man who was repentant and was wanting sin or was wanting to, to have forgiveness of sin. And so it says to forgive and comfort him. So not just to forgive him, not just to say, okay, you're forgiven, and then have a cold shoulder to him and ignore him, but to receive him back in as if he's, he's still your brother like he was before, to have this comfort for him. It says, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. It's very important here that these Corinthians were, were loving and also comforted this man because there was a possibility that this man could have gotten to a place of discouragement in his walk with the Lord, and he may have even walked away from his faith in the Lord. He could have beat himself up for his sins, and, and because no one was comforting him or loving him and, and letting him know about the grace of God now that he's repentant, he could have been so sorrowful, 
he would have even left the church and maybe even walked away from the faith. And so he was in a very vulnerable place inside of his life. And so the encouragement was, hey, not just forgive this man, but love him. Let him know. And it says in verse number eight, therefore I urge you not only to love, but it says to reaffirm your love to him. For to this end, I also wrote that I might put you to, to the test whether you are obedient in all things. Now from you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if, de- for if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for the, uh, your sakes in the presence of Christ. And so he's saying, listen, I put you to the test first. I, I put you to the test and my first letter saying you must be severe to this man and you were severe, right? Now I'm putting you to the test again and saying you must be loving and comforting to this man. And so we're going to put you to the test and see what you do because I want to make sure that you are obedient in all things. And the importance of them being obedient in all things is in verse number four, or excuse me, verse number 11. It says, lest Satan should take advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices. We must be obedient of all things lest Satan takes advantage of us. That word taken advantage of is something that belongs to us, him stealing that thing that belongs to us. And that's what the, the, the enemy wants to do. Satan wants to rip us off of our peace and our joy in Christ. He wants to find an area inside of our lives that he can expose and, and cause compromise and sin inside. He wants to, to slowly creep into areas in our lives that would make us walk away from the Lord what Satan started to do to this man. It started off with lust. He knew this man had an issue with lust, and so Satan knew that and took advantage of it. To take advantage of the church as a whole by saying, be gracious to this man and and let him continue in his sin, let him continue in his lust. And then it went from that to, well, now this man is forgiven and and he's repentant, but now I'm going to work in the church to make sure he's not received back and he's not loved. And then when they do that, then Satan is going to deceive the area in his life to make him feel like like the grace of God is not sufficient in his life, that he's worthless and that he failed to a point where Jesus couldn't even forgive him. And Satan will find the areas inside of our lives where he can expose it in our lives. He knows our weaknesses, he knows our struggles, and he is going to try to expose those things in our lives. But what's amazing about that is that we're not ignorant to it, right? It says, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We know Satan is going to attack. We know the ways he's going to attack us in our lives. And for everyone, it's different. We all struggle with something different entirely. And we must ask the Spirit of the Lord to, to give us strength and to show us where we are weak. Show us where the enemy is getting a foothold inside of our lives. This man and this, this church, they didn't realize it. They didn't recognize it. And, and not because... They were ignorant. Again, it says that they, we shouldn't be ignorant, but I think they were, in a sense, ignorant to what Satan was doing because they weren't after the heart of the Lord. They weren't seeking after the Spirit in their lives. They were living this, this, this kiddie game of, of, of being this baby Christian who, who has compromise and, and lives on the edge of what's sinful and what's not. And they weren't, weren't living after the heart of the Lord. But if we are living after the heart of the Lord, if we have the Spirit growing inside of us and being filled with the Spirit every day, how much more we are aware of the devices of Satan against us. He says in verse number 12, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I departed for Macedonia. So he changes gears here a little bit. He again explains his journey here. He again explains the reasons why his his schedule has changed. And he said one of the reasons why his schedule has changed is because the Lord has opened up a door for him, right? And if the Lord is going to open up a door for him, he's not going to reject it, reject it just because he made a promise to the Corinthians. No, if there's a door that's open inside of his life and he, he believes it is from the Lord, he's going to walk through that, right? The Bible says that we can plan our ways, but ultimately the Lord directs our steps. Oftentimes we try to plan our ways and and we try to have God sign off on it. As if I was a a contractor and you hired me to come make your home, but when I got there you already had the entire plan ready to go. 
and I began to give you my ideas of what I wanted to do, but you said, oh, well, actually, I have this plan. I, I really just need your stamp of approval. I need you to sign it, and it will be good to go. Oftentimes, we try to do that same thing with God. We say, man, I, I have my plans, and so I'm going to take these plans before the Lord, and, and I don't want them to change. I don't want anything done with them, but I just want the stamp of approval of the Lord on it. We can plan our ways. There's nothing wrong with planning them, but we must understand the Lord's going to change it time to time, and we must be obedient to that. Oftentimes, the way he does that, and he speaks in, in various different ways. There's not one way that God speaks to us. You can't ever put God in a box and say, if I do something this way, then God's going to react in that way. It's always different. But a lot of the time, if you don't know what you're doing in your life or where God is calling you, he'll open up a door for you. And the doors he doesn't want you to go through, he's going to close them. And, and the doors that open up, he'll also give you a peace. That as you pray about it and you read your word and, and you seek the Lord as the door opens up and, and you have a peace, then it's up to you to take that step of faith to walk through it and see what the Lord does. That's how um, Amber and I moved here. You know, we, we went to Bible college in California and we had multiple internship opportunities in, in Idaho and California and these different places. And for a little bit, it was, it was overwhelming because I was like, Lord, what do you want me to do? I have like 10 doors open and I don't know which one to take and I, I don't know what you're calling me to. And, and what happened is, is over time, the Lord began to close doors. The Lord began to, even if a door was open, not give us peace, not, not give us this, this area of, okay, this is something we want to do. And, and little by little, as we began to walk through a door, if it began to close, we decided, you know what, we're not going to try to force this open. If it's closing, then we're just going to forget about it. If there's no peace, we're not going to do it. But if this door is open, then, then we're going to take that step of faith. And, and that's what happened for us to come here to Tooele. And, and oftentimes, he does that same thing in our lives. A lot of times, we, we want to we hear from the Lord by this, this great big sign in, in the clouds, right? That, Lord, would you just speak to me? Would you open up the clouds and just tell me exactly what you want for me, right? Sometimes we may even test the Lord and say, okay, Lord, if this, if this happens, then I know for sure this is what you're doing. And I would tell you, be careful doing that. You know, I can't say the Lord can't speak to you in that way. We even have um, a biblical story of that with Gideon and the fleece. But it is very dangerous to do that because, you know, you might have a desire in your heart to do something and that desire might lead you to kind of convince yourself that it is the Lord speaking when really it's not, right? I heard a pastor share this story about um, this, this kid inside of his, his church who he was in his 20s and, and he had this girlfriend and he was praying to the Lord if this is um, the one he was supposed to marry and he wasn't sure. And so he said, okay, Lord, if, if you want me to marry this woman, then let these birds fly across my windshield while I'm driving on the highway, right? And he said, birds pass his, his, his windshield and went across the street and so he said, okay, Lord wants me to marry this woman, right? But you gotta understand too, I mean, Birds fly past your windshield all the time. You're just not paying attention until you finally are paying attention. So you, got, you must be careful when doing stuff like that because you might make the wrong decision simply because you think the Lord is speaking to you when really he's not. So again, I, I think a lot of the times the way that the Lord speaks to us and the way that the Lord directs us is by open doors. It's by peace inside of our lives when we seek him. And, and all we are to do is, is be faithful in walking through it, right? He's not going to force us through the open doors. We, we have our parts in taking steps of faith and walking through them and making sure we're not trying to force any doors that begin to close in our lives. And so this is what Paul is explaining. He's saying, listen, this was my plan, but you know what? The Lord had other plans. And I'm not going to, to miss the plans that the Lord had for me simply because you guys wanted me here and simply because I told you I would be. But the Lord had other plans in my life. It says in verse number 14, now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. I love this verse so much, man. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. What he's referring to here, this triumph in Christ, Paul is bringing reference to this triumphal parade that would be done in in the Roman Empire. This, this parade would be brought forth when um, there was a successful general that was 
returning from a successful conquest, right? So you would have these, these Roman soldiers who were coming back after a successful conquest, and so the people would build up this parade and would celebrate them coming home and celebrate all the spoils of war, and they would bring back prisoners of, of people who were kings and, and leaders of wherever they went and raided, and so they would have this parade welcome, welcoming them back, and it was this really big deal, right? People in, in Rome, they were really excited about these parades, and it was, it was this wonderful thing for them. And Paul, he may have even experienced this personally, and, and so he knows what it is to, to have this big old parade and this celebration, um, and he's saying that this is a triumph in Christ, meaning it's not this Roman triumph, but it's this triumph in Christ that we are in this parade celebrating the triumphal victory of Christ. And he's saying that, that, man, I want to be a part of that parade. I want to be behind Jesus as we're walking down that parade. And, and not only myself, but I want you guys to be a part of it as well. See, we must understand is that we may have our, our difficulties right now. We may bicker and complain and, and, and be in a, a tough situation in our relationship with the Lord. But may I remind you, we're not enemies. Because we're in this parade together. We're celebrating the triumph of Christ. And we must not forget that as believers, oftentimes we do the same thing and we backbite and we complain and we gossip and, and we become enemies of other believers. But we must look at it in the big picture. You know, we may have disagreements. We may not agree on everything with doctrine or, or our beliefs. But, but if we are believers, if you have accepted Jesus in your life, you believe he died on the cross for your sins and you have been forgiven and you have the salvation of Jesus over your life, then we are brothers and sisters in Christ regardless of our disagreements. And so this, this triumphal parade that we are in, because Christ has, trump, um, has triumphed and we are all behind him in this parade, and he says, diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Part of this parade, you would have these fragrances going from incense and, and these different perfumes from, from coming down and, and receiving the spoils of this war. And so... Paul, again, maybe experienced one of these parades, and one of the things he remembers is the fragrance from it, right? Scent, um, our senses and our smell is something that, that is very powerful, that if we have a smell um, and we associate that to a certain experience, oftentimes when we smell that again, it can bring up that experience again. It can bring up that memory again. And so Paul is saying that it's like this, this fragrance that was from these triumphal parades. It's, it's this beautiful um, smell of incense, and so he's saying that for us in our lives, we're part of this triumphal parade in Christ, so this fragrance should be coming off of us everywhere we go. That people would, would be able to smell the Holy Spirit, that fragrance on us by the way we carry ourselves, by the way we treat others, and simply by the peace and joy in our lives and how we, we deal with certain situations. It's not this phoniness. It's not saying, because I'm a Christian, I must walk around with this smile on me 24-7, and, and everything's Disneyland, and everything's good to go. No, listen, whether you're a believer or not, we all deal with trials. We all, we all deal with sufferings and pain in our hearts. But we have joy, and we have peace in our hearts that only Jesus can give us. We can't find anywhere else. And that is the most powerful witnessing tool you can ever have to share the gospel with friends and family and those around you. Oftentimes we feel like in order to preach the gospel and, and to be um, an effective witness for Jesus, then we have to know everything in the Bible. and We have to have these amazing debates and, and be able to teach people all these things. And, and then that's how we save people. And, and of course, it's important to know what you believe. It's important to know the Bible and to be able to explain the gospel to people. But a lot of the time, the way that we, the way that we are a witness to those who don't know Jesus is because of the joy and peace that we have in our hearts. It's because we can look back on our past lives before we knew Jesus and let them know, hey, before I knew Jesus, I was miserable. I was empty. I, 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 didn't, I, I, I wasn't fulfilled in my heart and in my life. But now that I know Jesus, man, now what a, a joy and peace I have. What an amazing feeling it is to have a Savior who, who has redeemed me. I love this quote. It's from C.S. Lewis. And I quote it all the time. I've been quoting it recently in the, the high school. But C.S. Lewis, in one of his books, he says, 
that Jesus was one of three things. It, it boils down to three things. He was either a liar, he was a lunatic, or he was Lord, right? He, he could only be one of those three things. And, and he existed, right? Everyone can agree whether you're in here and you're a believer or you're in here and you're an atheist. We all know 100% that Jesus was a, a, an actual person 2,000 years ago who, who lived and who died on the cross as crucifixion, right? An atheist won't argue that. So, so Jesus was a real person. The question is, what type of person was he? Was he a liar, a lunatic, or was he a savior? And I have multiple arguments to why he's not a liar, a, lun a, a lunatic, one of them being for a liar. I don't believe that if Jesus was just lying and he wanted to deceive people, he would be willing to take that all the way up to being beaten and crucified on the cross, right? If he just wanted to deceive people and he wanted self-gain, you'd think eventually he'd say, you know, I should probably get out of here because people are wanting to kill me. Or maybe I'll just admit that I, I, I was lying and that I'm not, I'm not God, right? And then the, these Pharisees will leave me alone and not kill me. So I don't believe he's a liar for that reason. So maybe he was a lunatic. Well, I don't believe he was a lunatic, again, for multiple reasons, a couple being, number one, Jesus was very sound in, in all of his teachings. He was a very sane person. He didn't ever contradict himself. He didn't say anything that was, that was just completely wacko weird. You know, he was, he was a very moral guy who, who was very loving and, and, and not about himself at all. There was no self-gain there. It was always pouring out to other people. He changed people's lives. You look at people in history who claim that they were the Messiah or they were Savior and, and they created these cults. The people who followed after them, their lives were destroyed. Their lives were ruined. It either ended in a suicide or it ended in them losing everything they own. But for those who followed after Jesus, their lives were changed. People who who were murderers and people who were prostitutes and people who, who lived wicked lifestyles, Jesus completely changed their lives around. And there's multiple reasons I can give to why I don't believe Jesus was just a crazy person who thought he really was the Savior. But even if you wanted to argue that, that he still wasn't Lord, even if you wanted to argue that he really wasn't the Messiah, what do I have to lose in believing in Jesus? Because my faith in Jesus has brought me so much joy and so much peace in my life. And you know what? If the atheists are correct and I die and there's nothing after death, what do I have to lose? I, I live this life happy. I live this life with so much joy and peace in my life. But for those who don't believe in Jesus, man, they have everything to lose if he is truly the Savior, which I do believe he is. And so this fragrance of, of being this example, being this witness to all of those who are around us, letting them know who Jesus is. Again, it may not even be by physical words. It may not even be by literally preaching the gospel. It could be simply by you just entering into the room and the way you carry yourself and you act and, and by having that joy and peace, the world will see it and they'll know there's something different about you. And that, of course, is the Spirit of God living inside of you and this fragrance coming off of you everywhere we go. He says in verse 15, For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. So first, we are this fragrance of Christ to God, and so, so God sees us and he smells the fragrance of his son and what he did, right? How important is that, that God views us not as the sinners that we are, not as, as those who are condemned and dying, but because we have the Spirit living inside of us, He smells that fragrance of that sacrifice that Jesus had done in our hearts. And so God sees us, and He sees Christ in our place. And then it also says, among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, to one, the aroma of death leading to death, and the other, an aroma of life leading to life. And so for those who are believers, this aroma is good, right? It's an aroma of joy. It's an aroma, it's just this fragrance that brings life. But to those who are condemned, those who don't know Jesus, it's, it's bringing this aroma of, of death and condemnation. You'd have to think, going back again to this triumphal parade, so again, this fragrance that Paul would have smelled, this was a good positive fragrance, right? It was a fragrance of victory. But you also have to think about those who were slaves, those who became captives, and who were likely going to prison or maybe even executed in this, in this parade. 
they smell that aroma, and it's not a, a beautiful fragrance, but it's an odor because it reminds them of their defeat. And it's the same thing in our lives as, as we live this life with this fragrance around us that for other believers, man, it's just confirming what the Lord has done and, and that the Lord is victorious. And, and at the end, there is no defeat for us, that we are victorious and we get to be with Jesus. But for others, it may be in the aroma of death and condemnation, showing them what their sin um, and their, their, their deeds are. And of course, praying that, that those people would come to know that as a good fragrance, a positive fragrance, but for some, it's not. It's leading to death. And we'll close with this. Is, is Matt here? We, we don't have Matt, right? Okay, so we're not going to end in a, a song. We'll just close with this verse. It says, And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not, as so many, peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. And so he says that we are not peddling, that we are sincere, that we are not doing this for self-gain or for any, anything that isn't for the Lord. The reason why Paul was so successful in his ministry is because everything he did, everywhere he went, he accounted God before anything else. He's saying, I'm not here to try to please you guys. I'm not here to try to put you before myself or before the Lord. I'm not here to, to glorify myself, to put myself before the Lord. But in everything I do, Anything I've said to you guys, any action I've ever done, it's not for anything other than sincere heart for the Lord. May that be the heart for us this morning. Then everything we do, as, as we are anointed and we are seer, sealed with the Lord and we have this aroma, this fragrance, we would also be reminded that we do these things out of sincerity. We preach the gospel. We are a witness, not for self-gain, not to please people, but to please the Lord of a sincere heart. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what grace and love you have for us, Jesus, and your redemptive power, Lord, that you are not one way, one day, and then a, a, another way the next day, but it is yes and yes and no's and no's and, and we can rely on your promises and your promise to us is, Lord, that we've been sealed with you. And Lord, as a guarantee, we have your spirit living inside of us. We have been anointed. And Lord, you are restoring us in our lives, Lord. May we continue that process of restoration every day desiring you and, and desiring a deeper relationship with you, Father allowing this fragrance of your spirit to, to be coming off of us everywhere we go, that people would recognize there's something different about us. The way that we treat others, the way that we deal with trials and hardships, and by experiencing your joy and your peace, Lord, if there's anyone in here this morning who has not experienced a joy in their lives, if they are not at peace in their hearts and they, they have a hole in their hearts, Lord, and, and they're trying to fill it with something that is not you, would you reveal to them, Lord, that only you can fill that void, Lord, only you can fill our hearts. Would you be with us this morning, God? In Jesus' name.